this one more time. State Ed. Uh, so today's lecture is a, another live coding lecture. Uh, most of the, the time, I'll, I'll be live coding, coding in IntelliJ and showing you how this stuff works. Uh, and I don't know what I'll end up coding. I want ideas from all of you. I do have a default option. If I don't get any ideas that'll fit into those state pattern structures, uh, I'll default to my, my thing that I have prepared. But uh, that's not as fun. I'd like to uh, get ideas from you if anybody has an idea, specifically if it fits well into a state pattern. If it's something that has different behavior based on its internal state, uh, and it'll fit into that pattern. I'll attempt, I can't guarantee what's going to happen, but I'll attempt to code it and simulate it without any control flow. Uh, and to give you another example of the state pattern. So on Monday, we actually covered everything you need to know about the state pattern. Uh, that, that was just, here's the state pattern, this is what it is, this is what it does, this is how we use it, this is where we use it. Uh, that was everything you need to know about the state pattern. On Wednesday, we reinforced that, showed a more complex example to, to get that sinking in better, to get you more familiar with this pattern. And then, of course, a more complicated lecture question. Uh, and today, and I was mostly in the slides, today I want to see the other side of that. Let's go mostly in the code. Stay away from the slides. I only have two slides prepared. Um, we'll stay mostly in the code and show you how that actually works. And I want to talk you through my design process. And uh, you can watch me live trying to figure out how to implement whatever you all come up with. So if you have suggestions, I'll be watching the Twitch chat. Uh, that's the ideal way for you to get ideas to me. Or if you just want to throw up your hand and shout something out, go for that too. Uh, since the whole goal of today's lecture is to reinforce the state pattern even further, if you do have questions uh, not related to what we're doing or not related to my live coding, you know, shout them out anyway. Uh, we can talk about those as well. If you have questions about the state pattern, anything that will help you understand the state pattern, uh, let's do it. I talk about the theory behind it and, and uh, kind of uh, what it is on Monday. Went through a complex example in the slides Wednesday. If I go through another example in the code today, I think that's a good strategy to get it to uh, get you understanding and help you with the homework. If, uh, if there's something else that you think would help you, I don't mean shout it out, hit it in the Twitch chat, let me know about it. All right, so today's lecture question grows in complexity a little bit. The, the lecture questions are trying to build up to the homework. Obviously, it's stopping way short of the complexity of a full homework assignment, um, but it's still not necessarily a straightforward uh, question. So for this one, we want to implement a car that has these five, uh, six, I can't even count, not off to start, these six methods. Uh, and just like the other ones, we have the API methods that we call to alter the state, and then we're going to use the velocity method to be able to check for the proper behavior uh, and put all that in a test car package. Uh, just like before, you can create other test suites if you want to test your internal, your implementation specific uh, code. You want to test some of that. You can write a separate test suite and use that one. Uh, but the one that you submit, the test car method, can only access these, me these API methods because uh, you have no guarantee that I'll have the internal implementation details that you chose. I might not have those methods, those state variables, and even if I do, I might have probably changed, uh, called them something different, just not something, uh, not something we can test. We're going to code and work with an API and not care about the internal details, which is the power of having an API. If you're working on a team, you say, I'm going to make write a car class with these six methods with this behavior, and then your teammate can call those methods, expecting them to work the way they expect them to work without having to care about the implementation details. They don't have to care that you use the state pattern. You could use functional programming or whatever. Uh, they don't have to care, and that's the power of the API. So just a, a little, expand a little bit on that. Uh, the car, the actual behavior we want, we're going to start off in park, not moving at all. Uh, zero velocity, and we have three gears that we can be in. If we're in park, the starting, starting gear, we can either shift into drive or reverse. Drive or reverse are going to have different behavior. Accelerating in drive is going to increase our velocity by 10. In reverse, decrease it by 10. So if we are parked, we create a new car, we shift into reverse and accelerate three times, our velocity is going to be negative 15 at that point. We also have brake functionality, either in drive or reverse. Hit calling brake is going to completely stop the car, set its velocity to zero, no matter what. It could have been going uh, accelerated up to a million. We don't care, we're going to set it to zero. 
And um, the reason for this, just to uh, just to kind of talk more about the state pattern here, is if the brake method decreased your velocity by some certain amount, or increased if you're in reverse, uh, up to zero or down to zero, uh, we could have that behavior. The reason this sets it to zero is so it works well with the structure of the assignment only. So I'm restricting no control flow, which is pretty unrealistic restriction. If this just decreased your velocity by a little bit, then uh, you would pretty much need a, a conditional in there. It's possible you can figure it out without one, uh, but I don't see how to do that. It's possible there's some really tricky, complex thing that you could do to avoid a conditional, um, but it would not be trivial at all. So uh, setting this to zero, this is just one of the things that I do that I'm doing to carefully craft all these lecture questions and the two homework assignments to make sure that you don't need any control flow. So that the control flow restriction is only saying you have to use the state pattern and not you have to get really creative with your ideas to be able to get around the control flow restriction. Uh, I, I brush up against the line in, uh, on Wednesday's lecture question, intentionally a little, um, and give you that bonus slide that said, okay, for max volume and min volume 10 to zero, um, 10 and zero, you can use the math.min, math.max methods to be able to set the volume within these boundaries. And we were able to do that. The only reason we were able to get away with that is because hitting the max volume and hitting the min volume did not trigger a, a state transition. If it triggered a, a, excuse me, a state transition, we wouldn't be able to do that same thing. We need a conditional. If math.min returns 0 or 10, uh, or math.max returns 0, math.min returns 10, then state transition. Uh, we won't be able to do it. When we get the velocity back to zero, we're back in the, uh, we're stopping, we're not moving anymore. And you can't shift apart from drive or reverse while moving. You would have to have some conditional there to be able to get around that. So just showing you that these, uh, these are carefully crafted to get around that no control flow condition is not a realistic condition in the real world. Um, I'll try, we'll try to come up with something Switch uh, vending machine. I don't want to do vending machine. Butterfly was from the last lecture. Uh, uh, but we'll try to come up with something and, and try to, I'll, I'll be aware while I'm gathering requirements of making sure that I'm not backing myself in a corner. I mean, I might, I don't know how to go, I might back myself in a corner where I need control flow, but, uh, but we'll try not to. Uh, but these lecture questions, I carefully craft them to not need control flow. So if you're wondering why some of the things are designed maybe a little strange, that's why. So let's wrap up the state pattern. I got two slides on this, and just talk a little bit thing, a little bit of things in summary um, about the the uh, the state pattern, when to use it, why to use it, and what it really does for us. So one thing it really does for us is it helps to organize our code when we have complex behavior, but in a in an object, but complex behavior that's uh, vastly changing depending on the current state of, uh, of what's going on. So if we ever have, if we have these situations where an object significantly changes its behavior beyond what we could just do with a few variables, uh, like if uh, uh, a player, we did the player examples in Jumper and in one of the lecture questions, going from standing to walking or running and increasing the jump height and the run speed. Like those are things that we realistically do with variables. We would say, okay, you're running, just set your speed to the running speed now. But we don't really have a lot of behavior that's going to change. We'll just uh, do that with variables. But when we have significant change, that's when we would be, that's when we start thinking about states and the state there. So that's when we would realistically use it out in the world. Uh, it helps implement our code once we have the structure set up, once we have our state diagram, our state transitions and everything, I've said this a lot throughout the week, but writing each method should be pretty easy. We're really confining our, our thinking. Instead of wrapping our heads around this entire behavior of this object, we're saying when it comes time to write the code, it's while I'm in this state and this API method is called, what's the behavior? It's a very narrow focus. We can wrap our heads around that. We can think about that. Uh, when I'm ducking and the jump button is pressed, what should the behavior be? Those methods get a lot easier to write after the structure is there. The downside is, is we're kind of moving the complexity 
to the number of classes. We have a lot more classes, a lot more, uh, a lot more structure to our programs, which uh, is a, usually a good thing, can be a good thing, uh, but it's also a bad thing in certain cases, especially when you bring somebody new onto the project, and the first thing they see is just a whole mess of classes, because you're gonna get a lot of classes in the state guide. Uh, they see a lot of classes, they can get intimidated pretty quickly, uh, trying to chase through the code. The code tends to become spaghetti code when you have the state pattern. Okay, this method was called, uh, I have this behavior, but my state changed, so now that next method call, I gotta go over to this other class to figure out what behavior I'm going to have. Uh, so it can be a little tricky to chase through the code. Until you show them the state diagram, you gotta start, you gotta have good documentation, have the state diagram handy, and show them, okay, from the state diagram, I can chase through this, what's going on. But going to the code itself, can be a little tougher to tra trace through, uh, trace through these things. Okay, um, this is on this slide. The third bullet point is not on here. But uh, another big con is the number of states can really get out of hand with this thing. So my my default question is, uh, which what do we have? Traffic light. I like traffic light. So we're not going to do my default question. At the very least, I'll do traffic light because I like that one. Vending machine, I, I kind of want to, I do want to do, but uh, I do use that as a quiz question. So I do have a vending machine that I use for that. Uh, so unless you define specific behavior that I, I don't have in that question, uh, some of you are probably going to see that next week, to be honest. So, uh, so I don't want to use that one. Traffic light, I like that uh, Pokemon, yeah, it's got two votes, but... No, I'm not doing that one. Uh, I did that for the 1 p.m. lecture. I just don't feel like doing the same thing twice. If you want to see a Pokemon example, we did evolutions in the 1 p.m., go watch that video. You can check that one out. Uh, the, uh, uh, the number of states can really bluff. So in my default example, uh, I have changing weather and deciding whether somebody's willing to go outside and venture out into the great outdoors, depending on what coat they're wearing. So if it's either snowing, raining, uh, nice uh, warm weather, cold weather, or uh, and whether they're wearing a winter coat, a rain coat, or no coat. So we have three different coats, coats, dates kind of, that they can be in, no coat, winter coat, rain coat. Uh, the weather can either be warm or cold, and it can either be precipitating or not precipitating. So if it's warm and precipitating, we've got rain, if it's cold and precipitating, we've got snow, et cetera. Uh, so we have two different states for the temperature, two different states for the precipitation, and three different states for a coat. Well, that means we have 12 total states here. We have two times two times three. We have to multiply these together. It can be, uh, it can be warm and precipitating with a raincoat. It can be cold and not precipitating with no coat. Uh, it can be cold, precipitating with a raincoat. There's 12 different combinations that we can have here. We have to multiply those choices. So we get this huge blow up in states really quick. If we want to add something like boots, rain boots, winter boots, or no boots, something like something silly like that, well, now we're up to 36 states. We have a literal, the literal definition, it's, it gets overused, but it is a literal exponential growth. We have to multiply every time we have a new choice. If we have, and all it would take is 10 states with binary choices, hat, no hat, coat, no coat, raining, or precipitating, not precipitating, warm, not warm. Uh, Ten of those choices with just two uh, two choices each, and we have over a thousand states. It's a thousand twenty-four. You just multiply it to uh, ten times, which is two to the ten. Over a thousand states already. So that's completely restrictive. If we're all in, like we are for these questions, if we're purely using the state pattern and saying no conditionals, which again, unrealistic uh, thing. That's just for educational purposes. Uh, we would have a huge blow up in states for a lot of things that we probably should just be using Booleans for. A lot of those should just be Booleans or state variables. You know, uh, Scala is the language. Uh, all right, um, so in summary, don't use the state pattern everywhere. I don't know if, I'll, I don't know if you have this problem or not. Uh, but the state pattern is, it's not like the next thing that you learn. A lot of what you've done so far has just been building up on itself and saying, okay, this is the next part of the program. This is the next thing that you need to know. Start with variables. Okay, we're going to use variables forever. Functions, you're going to use functions everywhere you go. Uh, conditionals, 
uh, loops. You're going to use those everywhere. Objects and classes, unless you work, end up working for a team that uses pure functional programming, you're going to see objects and classes. Uh, and, uh, and those are all building on themselves. Uh, testing, hopefully you work somewhere that does testing. Uh, and, uh, and this is somewhat the first topic, you know, with some exceptions. You dabbled in some web stuff and security uh, stuff in, in 115. You will use databases pretty much wherever you go. Uh, but uh, I'm getting off track. Anyway, uh, the state pattern is definitely one of those things that you might not see again. This is one of the first things where I'm showing you a design choice that you can make. You can apply this or not apply this depending on what projects you're working on, how you want to organize your code, how you want to structure things, uh, and just what approach you want to take. So, and that's why I have to force you to use it by restricting control flow because it is a choice. You don't, you never have to use the state pattern. It's never like the answer, but it is one of the solutions that can help you but you got to weigh the pros and cons and say, is this a situation where I should apply the state pattern? The same is going to be true when we talk about functional programming. I'll do the similar things. I'm going to artificially restrict what you can do to push you towards using functional programming so you have an idea of what that is. You're likely to see both of these things in your future, no matter where your careers take you. Uh, functional programming is not as popular as OOP, uh, but it is on the rise. It is becoming much more popular, especially as the systems start get being more distributed. Um, we'll talk about that when time comes, starting Monday. Um, but it is just one of those design choices. Do I, do I take a big OOP solution? Do I take a big functional program solution? What should I do in a particular situation? Uh, and more to the point, the state pattern, what I really want you to get out of the state pattern is understanding inheritance and polymorphism. Those are the two concepts that we've been using, and those uh, are applied in a, uh, an interesting way to formulate this state pattern. But it's really inheritance and polymorphism that we really want to see. Uh, and if you think of the learning objective, if you get that third bullet point and really can use the hell out of the state pattern, those first two bullet points are going to be mostly automatic. If you can do the state pattern, you got a good handle on inheritance and polymorphism because you can't do the state pattern without applying both of those concepts in a fairly complex way. Any questions on this before we? Get into some coding. Yeah, let's do another spec sheet. Yu-Gi-Oh, Final Fantasy, Minecraft. There might be something I could do with Final Fantasy. We don't do the traffic light. Yu-Gi-Oh! I, I never got into Yu-Gi-Oh! I wouldn't, I wouldn't know what to reference there. Flappy Birds. We could do... I might be able to do Flappy Birds. Anyone live have a suggestion? If you have specific specs, that would that'd be nice too. Let's dance. Uh, yeah, the, the traffic light makes a good example of something with states, but I want to I want to go for something a little trickier. Final Fantasy. I just don't know where it goes. Can anyone expand on Final Fantasy? If not, I'll just default to traffic light. Uh, oh, here's my, oops, that's not the right one. Here's my default one. I don't want to do that one either because it's super boring. It's so quiet in the room. Thank you, Twitch chat. You're bringing some life in here. Uh, and by the, I forgot to mention this in this one, but if any of you want to go to Twitch chat, that if you don't want to raise your hand and shout out, just uh, you can go on there. You know. uh, what was this? A ping pong game, I guess. A ping pong game? Like, yeah. We could do this. Let's go with it. 
ping pong. And what features do we want for this? Farming Simulator 2019. Yes, let me let me get right on that one. Uh, when it when it hits the ground. All right. So the ball ball can be on either side of the table or on the floor. Ball can touch the net. Maybe refresh me on the rules of ping pong too. This in the uh, what are the rules of ping pong when a does the ball have to it has to hit the table and then you can hit it. Can you hit it before yeah, it bounces? Yes, hit the table. It has to. You can't it. bounce twice. And it can't bounce twice. It just bounce twice in the game. ball must. Bounce once before you can hit it. Ball can't bounce twice. Uh, loses. Not loses, but. It can't bounce twice. Once it bounces twice, the person who's on the side where it bounced twice. The other person gets a point, right? And are there, there are rules for like serving too? I don't want to get too complicated, but but there are some. Yeah. Okay. So the person who hit it and bounces twice. The, the first bounce, that's the other player's turn to hit it. If they don't hit it before it bounces again, they're done. Like that, they uh, they didn't get the other person got that point. Oh, so we got to track some score. Track score. Ball must bounce once before you can hit it. If you hit it before bounce, other player gets a point. And I gotta simplify some things just because we have the you know we have a time limit here. Uh, but uh, so I'll say if it hits the table, we'll just assume that it hit on the proper side. We're gonna assume that it didn't go out at all. If it, of course, we will track if it hits the. Let's get rid of touches the net. If the ball, actually, I take that back. We, we can do this. If the ball lands out of play, last person to hit it, uh, hit it, the other person. Uh, so I'm wording this so awkwardly. Hit the ball. The other person <laughs> gets a point. I could not word that more awkwardly, but but we get what that's supposed to be. All right. Uh, ball must bounce once before you can hit it. If you hit it before bounce, other player gets a point. It can't bounce twice. If it does, the last person to hit it gets a point. And then out of play, that, that'll be if it hits on your, if you hit it and it hits on your side of the table or just off the table completely. Um, that'll cover all those cases. Okay, this is a tricky one, I like this. And we gotta track score to some degree. All right, so let me look at all this stuff and go through my thought process from the previous lectures. The first thing I want to do is develop my API. I have my list of features. I have my spec sheet here. My API is going to be any of the methods that I'm going to defer to my state, that's, that functionality that's going to change behavior, um, behavior in my state. So the ball landing. Let me write these as methods. And we'll assume that's in play. The ball landing out of, that's an unfortunate acronym, out of 
play when we're talking about object-oriented programming. Uh, and we'll distinguish between the players, uh, player one, player two, I guess. I was going to say left player and right player, but let's say player one, player two. Player one hits ball. Player two hits ball. Then we'll actually have some ping pong state not in the state object is going to be the player scores. So I want to keep those player scores outside of any of the, the state objects. All right, so let's go with this. If we finish by some miracle, we can add more specs, but let's take what we have here and simulate this ping pong game. Oh, three, we're in four, 4 p.m. Let's simulate this ping pong game with that functionality that we have defined there. So first, let's name this ping pong. So what I did there, uh, and I'll try to explain as much as I can what I'm doing here. Uh, what I did there was instead of just renaming that class, I right clicked it, clicked refactor, rename, and then renamed it like that. What this does for me is changes the file name in addition to the class name. Or if I just change the class name, the file name is now out of sync with my class name, and I don't get that nice uh, circle with the C. Uh, I don't get that nice functionality. Um, that also changes anywhere where I use this class. So if I have a huge program that uses this class in a million different places, or a method, I can do the same thing with methods. It's going to update every instance of that everywhere in the code. So I can do a quick, uh, called refactor, I can refactor that and make it cha that change everywhere instead of chasing down every single place where I use that thing. So a nice, uh, nice shortcut that we can have. All right, I want a few extra variables, player, Player one score is an int initialized to zero. Player two score is an int initialized to zero. The state which I almost abbreviated the instead of spelling ping pong. Uh, new I don't quite know what my states are going to be yet, so I'll just call this initial state and give it an instance, give it the reference to this ping pong game. And then I want, oops, I never cut those. Then we want our methods. If the ball lands, or any of these things, we're going to defer to our state. For that functionality. While landing. I think I could rename these to something better, but player one hits ball. Player two hits ball. Grab these, and one thing I like to do whenever I have, when I'm using the state pattern, is I'm going to create a new sub package for my states. So the reason I do this is because I want. Uh, let me focus on my typing here. State. Uh, because I want the states to be a little bit out of the way, a little bit hidden, if you will, from, uh, from the rest of the code. This ping pong class, this is the only way that anyone's going to interact with this code that we're writing. Nobody cares that this is using the state pattern. It just cares that the API works the way it's supposed to be. So for example, when we write testing for this, we call these methods and we make sure that the score is what we expect it to be. When we do that, our tests don't care, and the tests you write for calculator, and the tests you write for microwave, the tests you write for all these lecture questions, do not care that you're using the state pattern. There's nothing about the state pattern in those tests. 
If somebody writes this ping pong game using a functional programming approach or a procedural programming approach or any other approach, the test suite should be exactly the same. We just want to test the behavior. Does this have the proper functionality that we expect from the spec sheet? Uh, so these API methods are called from the outside world. Nothing else is, so I'm going to put the states in a separate package just to separate them a little bit, get them a little bit out of the way. Little, uh, little project structure, project organization. I'm going to call this game so I don't have to write ping pong every time. Ping pong import. And define my API in my state class. Now I'm going to actually give a definition for each one of these. I'm just going to default them to doing nothing. But I'm still going to call this an abstract class just to make sure nobody's creating instances of this class. Nobody can say new ping pong state. That state doesn't exist. It is an abstract concept of a state that just defines the API. Uh, I'm going to name it abstract to prevent people from creating ping pong states. They have to create one of the base class, one of the extending classes uh, to be able to create this. An abstract is going to prevent that from happening. Even though I have every method fully defined, I'm still going to make it abstract just to get that functionality that I want. All right. So now, what states do we want? We do have some initial state. I'm still just going to call it initial state here. It has to extend state ping pong state and forward that game. So it has to extend. Uh, it has to extend that to make sure that we we can use polymorphism and that we can leverage that. Going to override these methods. That's why we're getting errors right now. And at this point, we can go back to our ping pong class and get rid of all this scary red, uh, scary red stuff. We can import these classes. Why are you yelling at me? Cannot be initialized. Oh, because I have that abstract. Hey, there's that abstract keyword doing what it's supposed to do. So I don't want this one to be abstract. Get rid of that that red. So now this class is fully written, our ping pong class is done. We want to add all that functionality through states and state transitions. So we have the initial state. Let's try to think up what states are we going to need where the behavior of this game is going to change. So I want, let's see, initial state, and we'll say, well, let, let's just come up with some states. So. If let's say player one, let's say player one starts as serving, and player one is going to hit the ball, is going to be the first action. So initial state, let's say player one serving. Actually, I don't want to do it like that. I think that answers the question of what our initial state is. So I'm actually going to use that refactor and say the game starts as player one serving is the state. Server. And now I could just delete that E, but again, I want to go into refactor, delete that E, get this spelled. Sir. <laughs> hey, we'll, we'll get there. Serving, serving, we'll get there. Uh, but each time I do that, it's updating the file name. See, I did this on purpose just to show you. And it updates this initial state. Instead of initial state, it automatically updated that because I used the refactor. So the initial state, player one serving. I'm probably going to want a player two serving. Uh, oops. So after player one serves, I'm going to enter a state of where there's no bounces yet. Uh, player one hit, no bounce. So player one was the last person hit the ball, and we haven't had any bounces yet. Oh. Player one was the last one to hit one bounce.
player to hit, no bounce. Player two hit, one bounce. So I'm just thinking of all the different states I could be in where these methods, this API is going to have a different set of behavior. I think I got them all here. Player one can be serving, player two can be serving. After player one serves, we're going to be in this player one hit no bounce state. Player one hit that one's doing there oh yeah I'm gonna find out real quick what that one was doing there player one hit one bounce so after that first bounce what's the behavior player two hit and we have one bounce player two hit two bounce I had a typo on this one that confused me player two hit two bounce all right, so player one serving, this is going to be our initial state, so let's think about what all the behavior is going to be here. Uh, ball landing really doesn't make sense, I guess. I guess if they completely whiff the serve and the ball lands, let's go with that. So they completely whiff the serve, the ball lands, and uh, this.game.player2score it's going to, they're going to get a point, uh, they miss, and then player two would be serving. I need some help, I don't remember all the rules of the game. Yes, okay. Uh, you don't get a retry after the, the loss. And we're not gonna do the, the if you're, if you, if the ball lands, you're going to get a point. We're not gonna do, uh, if you're not serving and you would get a point, you don't get the point, but you get the serve. I guess we could do that, right? What's stopping us from doing that? Oh, yeah, that, yeah, we would have to. No, let's not do that. That'd be too many states. Let's keep it a little simple. So we'll break the rules a little bit here. Uh, but the game is going to move into the player two serving state with the game state. So each one of these methods should be, I pitch this forever, each one of these methods should be pretty easy to write. Each time, I'm not trying to think of all the rules to the game as I write that line of code. I, all I have to ask is, wait, what happens when player one's serving and they drop the ball? Uh, player two is going to get a point, and player two is going to be serving. Now, in this case, we could just get rid of this and have that actual functionality of not getting the point, but just getting the serve. Let's, uh, let's just ignore that, uh, that part for now, because that's going to get more complex when, for example, we're in the player two hit last and the ball bounced once. At, in this state and all the other states, we'd have to remember who initially served instead of just who was the last one to hit. So I don't want player one serving, player two was the last one to hit, and one bounce. And that's where we can start seeing the shortfalls of the state pattern. We're going to have that exponential blow up in states. And just to limit that, I'm going to break the rules of the game a little bit so we can get rid of that, uh, that kind of craziness. And we can finish this in the next 10 minutes. Uh, if the ball lands out of play, Again, they, the player one hasn't hit the ball yet, even. so that's going to be the same as the ball landing. It doesn't matter where the ball lands. If player one doesn't even hit the ball, it's, uh, that's just no good for them. Player two, I mean, unless they're really breaking the rules, they're not going to be hitting the ball. Again, this is just player one serving. Nothing happened yet. What's happening here? The ball can hit the table, in play, out of play, whatever. The only thing that else that matters is player one hitting the ball. This... We're going to say the game state is going to transi transition to new player one hit no bounce. This dot game. So now we're transitioning to a state. Player one is the last one to hit the ball, and we haven't had any bounces yet. So let's go to that state and see what functionality we, we would want there. If the ball lands, this dot game that state, we're going to transition into new player one was the last one to hit the ball and there is one bounce. If the ball lands out of play, player one is the last one to hit the ball, ball lands out of play, that's point for player two, according to our made up rules. 
and the game state shifts to player two serving. So again, each one of these methods should be pretty straightforward to write to get this, all the rules of this game, um, our rules of the game anyway. Player one hits the ball. Well, they're really not allowed to do that. They would have to serve and then hit it again before it landed. Uh, let's just say that they're not going to do that. Uh, or we could actually, whatever, let's, let's just say they did something so silly, uh, player two gets a point, and player two gets the serve. So if player two hits the ball, now we're the other way around. Player one is going to get a point, and player one is still serving. Player two is not allowed to hit that ball uh, before that happens. So the one uh, state transition that we're, we'll, well, the next state transition we'll look at, player one hit the ball last, and we have one bounce. This is where player two is allowed to hit the ball back. So the ball lands. If the ball lands again, that's the second bounce. That's player one's point. Player one serve. If the ball lands out of play, same thing. If player one hits the ball, let's say they're not going to do that. If the ball landed in play on that first bounce, they'd have to run to the other side of the table and hit. Let's just say they're not doing that. If they do, there's going to be no, uh, no effect. I mean, for completeness, uh, we should say that's player's two point, player two's point. Uh, and then player two hits the ball. We're going to transition into player two hit the ball last. Player two hit. I still have this one wrong. Three times to get this one. No bounce. Uh, we're going to go to two, player two hit last and no bounces recorded yet. All right, now let's player one hit no bounce. Let's uh, just go through these and kind of fill them out. So this is going to be all the same behavior except our ones become twos. Not that one. Oh my goodness. Player two, player one, and we have some duplicate code throughout these things. We would definitely clean this up a bit. Player one, player one. Player two hit no bounce. What am I, this, this doesn't seem right. Player one hit no bounce. Player one hits the ball again. Yeah, player two gets everything because that's just silly. Player two hits the ball. Yeah, no, that's right. So if player two hit the ball and hit the ball again, player one's going to get the point in the serve. If player one hits the ball on no bounce, player Two should get the point in the serve. Player one hit the ball, no bounce. Player one hits the ball again, player two gets it. Player two hits the ball, player one gets it. Nobody should be hitting the ball at that point. Player one hits the ball, player two gets it. Player two hits the ball, player one gets it. Yeah, I got this right. Uh, ball landing out of play, player two hit it and it didn't bounce, player one's going to get it. Uh, the ball landing. Player two hit one bounce. Yeah, we got everything. Uh, player two hit one bounce. There's definitely better ways we could be doing this. Ball landing. Player two score. Player two serving. Ball landing on a play. Player two. This part gets a little boring, doesn't it? Player one, player two serving is going to be the same as player one serving, just backwards. This is where the state pattern shows its shows a weakness. If we we're going all in, we would have a variable that says what player, whose turn is it, and then pass around that player as a variable. State pattern though, going all in with no conditionals. 
yeah, we got to do some silly stuff at times. So, so now that we have our ping pong game, we didn't miss any classes, right? In ping pong state, that's the base class. We're ready to start testing this thing. So let's test ping pong. This, get rid of this, get rid of all this. Game is fine. There's a new ping pong equals import new ping pong game dot. Player one serves, hits the ball, game dot, ball land, game dot. There's a lot of functionality to test. I won't even get close to, to having it all. Player It was an autocomplete in my slides, wasn't it, that capitalized that? Say player two hits the ball, game dot, ball landing out of play. So it's player one serve again, uh, player one hits ball, game dot, uh, player two hits ball, player one serve again, player one hits ball, Game dot. Uh, ball landing. Game dot. Player two hits ball. Game dot. Ball landing. Game dot. Ball landing. It's player two serve. Game dot. Player two hits ball. Game dot. Ball landing out of play. Assert game dot. Player one score. Assert. I lost track of the points. Somebody help. What should the score been? I lost track of the points a little bit. Two to two to zero. I, I thought I I thought I made sure at least each player scored once, right? Player one. What is it? Three to one. Three to one. <laughs> you know there'd be a pop quiz, right? Hits ball lands. Player two hits ball out of play. Player one scores one. Player one hits ball serves. Player two hits ball. Player one scores. Player one serves ball lands. Player two hits ball. Bounces twice, that's player twos. Player two hits it out of play, yeah, three to one. Uh, and let's run our ping pong, and I don't know, I'm, I'm confident here. Let's, uh, let's see if we get our green, green bars, green check marks. hey -o. We got three to one. So we were able to design our states, design our state transitions in our API, uh, and once we actually implemented the functionality, you notice all those methods, they're one or two liners. There's not much complexity to the methods themselves. And as long as my design, as long as I didn't make any mistakes in that design and implemented the methods with what they're supposed to do, we get all the functionality that we need. And we get our green check marks without really having to rack our brains too much. I mean, the design got a little tricky, but implementing the methods, simple. Each one of those methods.